I, I, I was able to come in only very late, but I heard some pretty interesting questions about f.call versus oh, calling f directly. So um, this session is going to be uh, popping the hood of the JavaScript engines and trying to see how they work. A couple of disclaimers. First, I did not propose this session. Uh, the session was proposed by a guy called Krishna Chaitanya. If you guys were following the schedule, uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, someone had to pick it up and I thought, well, fine, let me try try doing it. So I'm not an expert at this. Second thing, um, most of my limited knowledge comes from looking at Gecko and I mean Mozilla's uh, JavaScript engine and peeking at v uh, V8. I do not have any understanding of Nitro, uh, Safari's engine. And I know a little bit about Chakra, but I cannot reveal it because my employer forbids me to. So let's get started. I kind of wanted to have that ninja theme, the JS foo theme, so that's why this theme. Uh, bear with me, the colors are really bad. So, uh, JavaScript engine popping the hoods. Okay, looks like I didn't get enough attention. Let me try again. JavaScript engines popping the hoods. Yeah, I can see a lot of smiles. Good. So, uh, yeah, we'll be playing around with uh, JavaScript engines. Uh, through this talk, we'll be just doing one single, single thing. We'll try to understand how this simple equation, z is equal to x plus y, evaluates inside the browser. You give me a minute. It's kind of noisy there. So, uh, yeah. All that we'll be trying to do is trying to understand how a simple statement like z equals x plus y evaluates. So, uh, yeah, I showed you this, which means you're going to pop the hood of the car. So, I'll have to uh, have accompanying graphics. So, yeah, we are going to look what's inside the car. So, executing z is equal to x plus y is actually very simple. It's, a, it's an addition operator, right? x is a variable, y is a variable, z is also a variable. So through the session, we'll just look at how it works. So the first thing, the first thing whenever the compiler or whenever your interpreter or your JavaScript engine encounters this statement is that it reads it from the memory. I mean, we all know that the first thing you have to do is parse it, right? So that's what is reading from the memory. That's when, uh, thing, uh, this is after which the things get start, in, uh, things start getting interesting. So once it has read the statement and it has understood it, it has to do things like get the value of y, find where x and y is, read their values, probably make sense out of their values, choose the meaning of plus. I mean, what if x and y are strings? Or what if x and y are floats? What if x is a string, y is a float? Things like that. Save z back to memory. And then, yeah, at the end of the day, once you've done all your uh, partying, you'll have to do the garbage. So, yeah, we'll have to do garbage collection also. Uh, you may not understand all the seven steps yet, uh, however, I will be talking through the seven steps. Uh, one request is, if you think you can add any more data points from what I have in the slides, please feel free because this is not a lecture, it's a discussion. It was included in the discussion topic under the JSU schedule, so please uh, feel free to interrupt and add in more gyan. I'm sure people will appreciate it. So first thing, reading operation from the, from the memory. What do you think happens whenever z is equal to x plus y is encountered? You get to a... Uh, lexical analyzer or you get to a tokenizer. So uh, anyone done compilers class in college? How many loved the compilers class? Okay, there were like five hands that went up for compilers class and how many loved it? There were like two hands remaining. Okay, how many uh, said that compilers was important when you when you did your engineering? Or when you did, com okay, so one hand, two hands, good, in three, good, the hands are coming up, nice. So I'm not going to go into the basics of what compilers are, how, how tokenizer happens. Let's just assume that because the meaty part is what happens after it. This is like classic textbook stuff. Uh, the thing is, WebKit uses a lexer, uh, lexer called Flex. And the basic thing is, it's not a simple context-free grammar. Uh, you just can't write rules because JavaScript is this ever-forgiving language that lets uh, that as, uh, that adds in semicolons that does the semicolon insertion, that does co uh, type coursing automatically for you. So JavaScript is forgiving in that way. And all those rules are, in, are put in inside the tokenizer. Once you have the tokenizer, you know you will be able to separate x, y, and z uh, separately in the statement. Once it is done, you create what is called an abstract syntax tree or an AST. Can anyone help me define AST? What's an abstract syntax tree? It's effectively a tree that says z is at the top, you have two nodes saying uh, x plus y, and how, how does the expression basically look like? And uh, WebKit uses Bison, which is a bottom shift, uh, bottoms up shift reduce parser, which means that it reads one line after. So when I said z is equal to x plus y, it starts from z 
and then tries to construct the expression one after the other. Uh, Gecko, on the other hand, does not use any. I have not seen it using any uh, any specific parser. So I think it is a top-down parser. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's a homegrown top-down parser. But WebKit for sure uses Bison, or used to use Bison. Uh, so what you have now at the end of this stage is an abstract syntax tree or an AST, which effectively tells you what what does this mean. Now this is all the boring parts. Let's get into the actual parts where browsers come in. There was a question there. What is that? Okay. So, uh, yep, this is where the interesting parts come in. Uh, can anyone tell me how many types is Java a type language or an untyped language? How many say people? How many people say it's untyped? How many people say it's typed? Actually, it is loosely typed. There are types in JavaScript, and the funny thing is, it is this simple reason of types that makes compiling JavaScript a, a real pain. So the only reason why JavaScript probably is not able to compile as fast as C or not able to execute as fast as C is because it, it is typeless. So the problem is X and Y could be anything. X could be a number, string, object. Uh, there are like eight or nine specific types and it could be one of them. The issue here is if they were well-defined types. So for example, if it was a string or if, if it was an integer, you could always directly point to the memory location where the integer was available and read the integer. So imagine that it's like a 32-bit integer. You know that the boundary is 32 bits. You know how to get it and you know what the offset would be. Imagine that it's a, it's a typed array where every integer in the array is an, every element in the array is an integer. In that way, how do you get to the, uh, if it's a 32-bit integer, how do you get to the third element? 3 into 32. No, it's not 3, it's 4 into 32, it starts with 0, right? So offsets are not possible in JavaScript. That's one problem. The other issue is, all these values of x and y are not just variables. These variables are also dependent on what contexts are. So closures, for example, can change the meaning of what x and y means. So x is on the global versus x is inside a closure. The closure will get weightage, right? So you have scope uh, hiding there. You have local, local variables, which again mask scopes. Object properties can mask scopes using pro prototypes in the entire prototype hierarchy. And finally, you have the good old friends like eval, width, etc which actually say that with an object, eva evaluate something. So this is, this is all the cause of uh, confusion why JavaScript is not able to execute as fast as C. So let's look at what happens if it's an array. Well, if it's actually an array, it'll be something like object of x, right? In that case, uh, the idea is, if it's a dense array, you can get it. You can always, so if, if you know that the array is of same type, and you know that uh, all, all the elements in the array are int 32, 32 bit integers. Uh, the way to get to the fourth element would be 5 into 32, right? So uh, the problem is, it's not as simple because uh, whenever you create an array, you can put any kind of, you can put a string and then you can put an integer. So you don't know where the array boundaries lie. So one thing is, uh, one thing however is, the denser the array, the better for you. I'll tell you why. Uh, the funny thing, so this is one thing I noticed in Firefox. If you push the array from 0 to n, it is dense. However, if you push it from n to 0, for some reason it is not dense. It, it creates a sparse array and it does a performance fault. Uh, I don't know why. I have not had the patience to uh, peer into the uh, Firefox source code to understand why this does, but yeah, this, this is something that I found. The other thing is things like named, so if, if OBJ is an array, you know that you can also do OBJ of name, where you can add, it, add a named property. Instead of saying OBJ of 0, you can also say OBJ of name. Funny part, this also creates uh, this also creates sparse arrays. I'll tell you why sparse, sparse arrays are a, are a problem. So we saw array. Let's look at what objects are. And here's where I would be talking specifically about Firefox and uh, Chrome. So if X is an object, how, so in the previous se uh, session, I'm sure you would have heard about how the prototype uh, chain look, uh, lookup happens. So if if someone does an object of uh, dot X. First, where does it look? Does it look at the local scope or does it look at the object property? Funny, it will not look at local scope because object.x is already defined by pro object, right? So there's no local scope. So it starts with object.property where it looks at the pro uh, current pro uh, object, it goes one level higher, looks at its prototype, and then traverses all the way up to the parent element, which is, what is, that, what is the prototype of all prototypes? Object. It will go all the way up there. That's how normal lookups happen. 
this is where uh, the browsers try to act smart or this is where the browsers try to say that they can speed up things and this is one thing this inline cache is one very very clever thing that was introduced in the browsers so every imagine that you have to uh, access object.x like 10 times and object.x is in the 10th prototype chain do you think you'll have to pro traverse the prototype every time that's painful right instead this ICs or the inline caches come into play this was I think first introduced in uh, gecko 2 I'm not sure uh, it was a gecko thing what these guys do is they so imagine that there's a object called x colon 1 there's another object called x colon 1 and y colon 2 what happens in the background is the browsers create what you call shapes and what a shape says is if the shape of an object is x colon 1 or x colon 20 or x colon 30 or a colon 30 that's one specific shape right so in that case it knows that whenever whenever a object name x or whenever a property name x is accessed to an int 32 look at this this location so it will, the offset is automatically set so for example say this takes up like uh, 10 spaces this takes up like 32 so you say that the way you would look at the integer is start looking after the 10th space to the 30, 30 second space right so that's how offsets work so however offsets are different for uh, the second element where there's another y colon 2 because how do you get to the second mem uh, second member you'll have to look at the first member and then start looking at the offset of the second member or in fact they may even be sparse you never know basic premise to take away is all of these objects have shapes do javascript objects have shapes no they don't right uh, does JavaScript use class inheritance or prototypal inheritance? Prototypal, right? Uh, what is the basic difference between class and prototype? What, what, what do you do in a class? You define the members and then create objects of that class type, right? In JavaScript, you just create objects and then you create, start creating more objects. Funny, browsers th don't think that that's smart. Though we love doing it, if you notice, these shapes are nothing but classes. In fact, WebKit stores these memories and calls them hidden classes. It's more like telling you that you guys are not the greatest. C++ guys are doing the great things. So as a JavaScript programmer, we all love prototypal inheritance, but on the background to speed it all up, classical in it's, it's effectively the idea of classes. Though there is no real inheritance as such, the only kind of inheritance is if x fails, go to the next shape, then go to the next shape, and then so imagine that I started x colon 1 and then I add another property. So the only kind of reference between classes is this shape refers to that shape. So at the end of the day, shapes are all classes. And as I said, if a new shape or a new class is created for every property that you add. The best part, now that you have classes, even if it's a prototype, cha a prototype chain, you will know how to locate the 10th prototypal element. So instead of having to go 10 steps, you are able to do it in one step. Uh, that's about objects. The only problem was about closures. You know what happened? So, in pro prototypes, are very, prototypes are very well defined. However, let's take a look at how closures work. Can anyone quickly define what a closure is? Louder, louder. I, I, I get that this is a little bit uh, into C++ and not the JavaScript realm, but uh, it's a function within a function where you have a reference to an inner function. Perfect. So, the issue with closure is whenever a closure is called, so there's a top function, there's a function inside, and whenever you refer a variable here, inside the function, the JavaScript engines create something called an activation context. What this activation context does is it copies the variable that is used into the activation context so that it is available to the inner function. Uh, yeah, so there's a closure at the top, there's a closure inside, and you're referring, the inside guy refers to some variable outside. Actually, you know what, heck with PowerPoint. Where is my cursor? Yeah. You know this is better, isn't it? I am not typing. So you have a function. I am still typing in. Wait, give me a minute. The reason there were two functions was because I didn't see the first one. So there is a var x here. Okay. There is another function. Pardon my bad live typing, but yeah, I thought this is better. So, okay, so how does this inner function know what the value of x uh, of the uh, x which is outside is, right? This is closure. Do you all agree? 
you have used this in your code right uh, the way it works is whenever this guy is parsed or whenever this guy is initialized it sees that uh, it sees that this x is used but this x is available here and hence what it does is whenever this gets this is run to this guy what all are the environment that is passed is an activation context and what is there in this activation context the value of x and it will not just be this it will be activation context all the way up to all closures okay so uh, tell me this uh, we saw a trick previously right where prototypal inheritance was changing so i i just told you that uh, for example if i do this uh, say i say x colon 1 oops i say this and then uh, this is just to reiterate what i said previously so what is the prototype of a what is the prototype of a b right I should have technically defined this earlier, but yeah, prototype of A is B. Oh, yeah, I can. You can do all sorts of magic in Notepad, so I'm sure they'll let you do this. Better? Oh, so the I okay, so that means that the last example was was not visible, and you were okay with it. Anyway, so um, this is B for me. and when i try, try something like a dot y what happens it will try to look at y here y is not available what will it do next go here look at this and y is available and print it here right that happens the first time but you know what what an inline cache does whenever it encounters a state what is was there a question whenever an inline cache when, whenever it encounters a statement like this inline cache cancels it and says that instead of doing this hit something like this say offset of 100 where y is actually available so rather than having to do the chain every time you are just getting an offset so this is this is typically the first example of a just, just in time compile was there a question inline caches are shared only across similar, similar objects because otherwise the offset will be incorrect right okay, so then, then share, the, a, new a new class so so what happens is for this there will be say let's call it shape 1 okay let's call this shape 1 now if you do something like this shape 1 is removed shape 2 is created you know the funny part is if you say something like what, what do you think happens shape 1 still exists but a has shape 2 now and whenever you try to do a dot x this is how it will be called. Clear? So inline that that's about inline caches. Any questions on inline caches and closures and how the just in time compile just in time happens? Okay, so let's move on. So all this is good, but the question is: so as I told you, opcodes are generated, right? I showed you how the opcode looks like. It probably will be a read from this memory location at this offset. That's how it will typically be. So, something like this. So every shape will know what memory location it is at. You know the funny part is, I know where to start reading, but do I really know where to end reading it? When I say obj.x, x could be a string, x could be a number, it could be anything, right? I really don't know where to stop reading because it could be 32 bits, it could be 64 bits, it could be anything. That's where all uh, loosely typed languages have to have a notion of boxing an input. So what happens is when you say x is equal to 10, what are you telling JavaScript? You say that store 10 in a variable called x. Uh, and you are very proud about the var key keyword, right? When you say var means it's a variable, you can assign anything. You know funny what Firefox, what these browsers actually do? They do something like this. They save it, say not just 100, they also say what the type is. And the type is not going to be number because what what can I, what is a JavaScript number? What it is? A, it could be floating point. What else can it be? I can't hear you guys. Uh, boring, interesting. It could be floating point. It could be a simple decimal. It could be it could be anything, right? So how do you define that? So 
this int 32 is actually an operating system specific uh, uh, integer. So this is a 32 bits integer and the value there is 100. So every time you say x is equal to 100, this is actually how it's stored. And you know what happens? Uh, browsers kind of do the tricky part again because all JavaScript numbers are supposed to be IEEE 754 uh, floating point are supposed to adhere to this, this specification. You know what the problem with this is? This is a 64 bit long uh, integer. And if you, if you say x is equal to 1, how many bits do you really need? Louder. You just need one bit, right? I mean, you definitely don't need 32 bits. Or you definitely don't need 64 bits. Is that correct? So let's. So what these browser guys have done is they said let's just cheat the standards and try to optimize or try to squeeze out the last juice if I can. So you know what they do? They just don't care about it. They use 34, 32 bits to optimize it. So this is specific to Firefox. I do not know how Opera or how uh, uh, V8 works. Uh, so, if anyone has information, would be glad to add it in. So, effectively, it just uses 32 bits, and if it goes higher, it uses uh, doubles, or it effectively overflows into doubles. Uh, this is, t if you notice, this is very similar to what encoding is. Anyone here heard of Huffman encoding? What does Huffman encoding do? It shortens wherever it can. Yeah, so it's effectively shortens wherever it can and for the things that it cannot, which are rare cases, it kind of keeps it long. So it's kind of differential encoding here. And there are different ways to box a value. So when I say, okay, so hence going forward, I'm going to start using the terms boxing and unboxing. So whenever you say x is equal to 100, the JavaScript uh, engine boxes a value and stores it. So it effectively stores it like this. Storing it like this is called, a bo is called, a bo is called boxing the value. JavaScript, when it tries to read it back, it's called unboxing, okay? So there are different ways to do boxing or just like there are a million ways to do encoding, there are different ways to do boxing. I'm not going to go into details of this, but uh, one, if, if you guys are operating system guys or if you guys are microprocessor guys, you should know that uh, WebKit does NAND boxing, which is a very standard. How many of you here have heard about NAND boxing? Uh, NAND boxing is a way of, uh, so you know, uh, what is a JavaScript NAND, N-A-N? not a number. And what does NAN equal to? Is NAN equal to NAN? Louder. No. So effectively the idea of NAN is, NAN is like this 51 bit space and then there's a, so effectively the entire 64 bits, you have some space reserved for NAN and the rest is just ignored. Rest could be zeros or rest could be anything. What these browser guys cleverly did was effectively reutilize the space that you are not using in NAN and say that if the value is NAN, or if the initial bits are NAN, that means what is stored is, uh, an, uh, is, an, is a number. If it is not a NAN, it's an uh, overflow. And if it's a NAN and everything else is zeros, that means it's actually a NAN, not a number. So they've tried to use this convention, and that's what is called NAN boxing. Uh, guys at Mozilla are obviously very clever. They have a pun of word on NAN boxing, and they combined NAN boxing and pun and called it NAN boxing. And the basic idea here being, um, but to put it simply, uh, NAND boxing, uh, NAN boxing favors doubles while NAND, NAND boxing does not. Basically, it says that the meaning of the mask is swapped in NAND and NAND boxing. I mean, you just need to know this. I'll, let's not even get into the details. The funny part here, however, to notice, NAND boxing is supported only on 32-bit. Or NAND boxing supports only 32-bit integers. So for all the guys who are wondering how a Firefox 64-bit uh, JavaScript engine will come, uh, I'm not sure. This, however, is done by V8. And you know why V8 does this specifically? Uh, the reason V8 does it is for uh, V8, unpacking the box and directly writing it to the register is easy using NAND boxing. And that's exactly, that's, the, that's apparently the reason why they chose NAND boxing over anything else. Uh, okay, let me break here. Too complex, too simple. Shall I continue? What? Too complex? Uh, n not really because the number of, so effectively I'll be telling you what the similarities are and calling out the differences because uh, an exhaustive list of uh, differences would be like too much to cover. So I'll effectively be telling you how they basically work. I mean, what you saw here was all of them do boxing, but Chrome does NAND boxing, Firefox does, does NAND boxing and I, I told you the reasons why. So uh, back to my question, is it too complex? Do you want me to continue at this pace or do you want me to dull down a little bit? 
this is good right yeah. good so what we did is uh, we read the input so we read the boxes of x and y imagine that they are just two treasure chests we have read two tre treasure chests of x and y and what does javascript have to do with those treasure treasure chests it has to open and actually see what's inside right it has to understand the value of x and y because if you give this to javascript you know what's it going to say it says i don't know what types are i don't know what in 32 is i want to know what a number is right that's what it will want to know so effectively this is what the javascript engine should know what i've done here is try to show you what nan box is and what a nun box is so this is a nun box value so this is the initial uh, this is the initial mass that's the value so for, a, for to give you a classic case this is not a nan and hence it's a double this is a nan, this this is inside the nan space because this is the nan uh, bit and hence that's a integer that's how typically nan box and nun boxes work you don't have to understand this yet just know that it's a way to flip between uh, uh, whether it's a it's a flag that tells you whether it's a decim decimal or a long whether it's a decimal or a float that's all you need to know so similar example for nan boxing as i told you nan boxing has 64 bit portability funny only 48 bit 48 bits are uh, supported and as i told you the reason why v8 does or you may say that v8 is good with numbers right reason is because it fits into the register it's able to directly unbox it into the register okay so let's so what did we see how many steps did we see okay i didn't bring this picture up on purpose i'm sorry but we so what all did we see we saw this right quick summary what does this do what is this uh, operation it's lexical analysis right it's tokenizing and parsing what does this do louder louder inline caches it effectively tells where to get the location of x and y what does this part the third step do it has gotten the boxes now it it, it has effectively gotten the boxes i have told you what boxes mean now what does step 4 do you open up the box and see what's inside it finally you actually have done x plus y let's actually perform the operation already right so let's stop talking and let's actually do what happens here so going back oops yeah so you know what 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 the interpreter would typically do interpreter would typically see th this is how the interpreted code looks like for x plus y it will say if x is type in 32 and y is type in 32 then do this otherwise and if the result is an overflow or an and do this if one of them is a float do this if and it goes on and on and on and it does this for every single uh, it does this for every single variable variable type so now you know why your uh, javascript interpretation is slow right the moment you want to do x plus y what happens imagine that x and y are strings probably the if loop is going to be at the end right so all these conditions are checked isn't that kind of bad that is kind of bad and that's where uh, the just in time compile comes in can anyone quickly help me define the term just in time compile generic what is the generic meaning of jit just in time can't hear you it compiles when you run okay anything else what is that it does it only when it's needed good what else you know all these definitions are actually correct just in time compilation is instead of having to interpret and run so many op codes or so many assembly language codes you may as well just compile it into one machine code and whenever this is hit whenever x plus y is it just redirect yourself to that op code isn't that going to be easier it is right so that's exactly what just in time is let's start with the basic old age old uh, just in time you know it's kind of funny that i put this car picture because the rate at which the browsers have evolved when i say basic jit i'm talking about the yeager monkey times i'm talking about like 3 years ago so the, i should have put this car that that way actually we disrespectful to all the people who thought about jit but yeah sorry so you know what jit does this is the basics of it if the types of x and y are known if you know that x is an integer and y is an integer how do you write an assembly code to add them you will copy both of them into the register and you simply add them right this is where shapes so effectively if you know that they are integers you don't have to box and unbox them am i correct and boxing and unboxing is expensive right so effectively if you know the types of this you don't have to box and unbox so basic idea being try to somehow determine what the type is 
and dependent on every type so i told you that every type has a shape right or a hidden class so for every single class try to generate the opcode so imagine that you say x plus y where x and so if you are in a loop for example and you say if you say x plus y inside it instead of having to run the interpreter every time what it will do is it will try to know that the uh, x and y have specific classes in this case they are integers and it will redirect you automatically to that code this is the basic of uh, jitting however there is a problem with jitting you know what uh, if you add an int 32 plus an int 32 the result could overflow isn't it if you so adding is one operation what about multiplication what about division you can have a nan problem with uh, basic jitting is it still has to execute those checks so remember, remember i told you here these checks if nan then result is nan if it overflows then make the result as a float because what you have to do is once you get the result you have to save it back in memory how do you save it you have to box it and save it right that's extra cost so basic jit has, still has the problem of uh, uh, of having to check do all these basic check basic checks and you know this is when v8 came out or uh, jit was happening and this is when v8 came out and all of you guys realized that wow chrome is so fast right so one of the things about chrome being fast apart from the dom interaction is the javascript engine and that's where they went to the next generation which is a type jit how many of you here find that chrome is faster than firefox even today okay let me put it this way how many of you here think that the chrome javascript engine is faster than the firefox javascript engine uh, why do you say that any any objective reasons why do you say chrome is faster feels faster you know a lot of people say that in fact have you guys taken a look at chakra i9's uh, javascript engine you know the funny part is chakra trace monkey uh, v8 in fact i'm sure even nitro all of them these days seem to do almost the same kind of optimization i mean this is a well published uh, topic today what was unknown 2 years ago all these tricks are followed by almost every engine today so the java the actual speed difference that you feel may not be in the javascript engine it could be something else so let's look at the sports car and this is today by the way so let's look at the sports car the basic idea is first thing every time you compile compilation takes time right you have to try no this is in 32 you have to know the other one is in 32 get generate the opcode that takes time right the basic idea of crow the basic idea that was started was called tracing which is observing and identifying hot code and when i say hot code okay uh, a quick uh, reference to java what is a hot spot in java yeah it's effectively a, a place of code that's running currently and you can swap in and swap out code out of it right so effect, it's pretty much that the basic idea of a hot hot code is that you have to identify code that runs very very frequently for example iterations so the 70 iterations is the number that trace monkey gives us what is trace monkey firefox's uh, javascript engine it was called jaeger monkey previously i don't know which version they changed it i don't remember that but spider monkey was way old so after spider monkey we had jaeger monkey trace monkey and now they are working on ion monkey so so that's one the second thing is crankshaft crankshaft basically are simple rules for example not all optimizations have to be made in uh, inside the inside loops only you can also have loop invariants what's a loop invariant you say i is so in, in a, if i is the index of the loop you say i is equal to i plus 70 into x 72 into x is, is does not change its value inside the loop right that it's invariant in the loop it does not vary in the loop so it's an invariant so they have certain heuristics like that and apart from that there are like tons of these heuristics and the problem with heuristics is you don't know whether they'll win or they'll uh, they'll lose or when when will they lose and what will happen you know v8 has actually gotten the heuristics pretty good that's what i have read at least and that's why you feel that the javascript of v8 could be faster so effectively type jet is nothing more than identifying and uh, so already look at the source code once before executing it look at the source code once compile parts of the source code that you can and when you are actually executing it just go back to the place you can compile right that's how it works problems one initial compilation cost funny part is you know there are clever javascript programmers like us who do x is equal to 10 and then x is equal to x plus years old so that you can print 10 years old right all of us are clever all of us love how many of you have done that till now 
Okay, that's interesting. You have never changed the variable type have you, uh, in your code. Have you ever says, uh, assigned a, a variable to a number or to, terms, to something else and then reassigned it to something else? Have you done that in your code? How many? All of us. You know what? All these JavaScript engines are looking at us and, and, and they've just give up, given up in frustration. All, you know what these guys do? They, they put up the shapes and all nicely. They bring up an opcode and see what to execute. And then suddenly they encounter your statement that changes the type. And they said, oh crap, we'll have to do it again. They throw it away, redo the whole thing again. So one good practice, which, which is a good practice today but may not be a good practice tomorrow is uh, observe type safety. If x is equal to 10, let x be equal to 10. It's, it, you may want to do x is equal to string, that, that could be acceptable. But the JavaScript engine may not like it. It may have to throw away its optimization. And this is the classic way TraceMonkey works. That's only inside the interpreter. So if you're if you're running it today, all these checks won't really happen. Your code would have already been compiled into uh, if it's a hotspot in the code, it would have already been compiled into opcodes. So this doesn't always happen. So the way it typically works is this is the worst thing that can happen, right? So it tries with what the best thing is, which is try to understand the type. If the type doesn't work, do this. You know what, what is worse? It will not just do this. It'll, while doing after doing this, it will also try to compile your code, which is extra cost. So sports car is done and we have the next generation of jitting. The basic idea is till now you try to infer the types, right? I told you that typing is the biggest problem. Till now what you have done is you have tried to infer the types. However, there are pretty interesting researches going on in the Iron Monkey team in Firefox where you are trying to prove the type rather than actually uh, uh, infer it. So have, has anyone here heard of Kaha, C-A-J-A? Yahoo, anyone from Yahoo? Yahoo ad safe. So all these are basically static code, JavaScript static code analysis. Uh, JavaScript itself is a dynamic language, but you can actually get something out of statically analyzing it. I mean, if you read the code, there are good chances that you will find out that you will be able to prove that X is actually an integer. So that's the basic idea of the next generation compiler where what you do is you reduce the number of checks. Effectively, this is it. You reduce the number of checks so that you only take one path. Idea being type stable JavaScript. How many of you would like to do int x is equal to 10 in JavaScript? How many of you love doing var x is equal to 10? Wow. <laughs> you know, every single browser baker today or every single engineer on the JavaScript team is probably thinking these guys must be nuts, man. But well, they are system programmers, your application programmers, your business logic requires it, you have to do it. So, type stable JavaScript is the basic way you have to get to. You can't write type stable JavaScript. You, so if you noticed, Action Script had this thing where you actually declare the types, right? You know, that's a clever way to put it. You can either have it as a var or you can have it as an int. In fact, even C sharp has it. And that actually speeds up the compile. That, that effectively is proving that type, uh, types do not exist. So that's one. The other interesting thing is most machines today have multi-core processors, right? You know what a very clever uh, JavaScript engine will do? Boxing and unboxing values, it will actually defer it to the second processor because box, boxing is effectively numerical computation, right? So one, one processor runs, the, uh, runs your entire code, the other processor is boxing and unboxing it. Or in fact, this is what Chakra does. One, pro, one processor runs your code, the other processor is automatically generating opcodes for you. That effectively uses both the processors. And when, so th when you hear someone saying that my JavaScript engine uses multi-core, effectively this is something that they will be doing. Clear? And uh, do you know what a GPU is? And everyone has been hearing that GPU enabled browsers are fast, right? Aren't you curious what GPU enabled browsers mean? How, can, can, you any, can you anyone define what a GPU enabled browser is? Someone from say Microsoft or someone say Firefox? Which, which executes, uh, like, which runs a parallel thread in which like few operations are uh, done in the GPU. So for an example, Correct. So the basic idea is you can defer uh, certain computations to the GPU. Unfortunately, the GPU today has been only utilized for shaders or WebGL or Canvas kind of things. So you, so all these shaders, if you notice, are typed. So uh, in JavaScript, you also have this WebGL standard where you are coming up with blobs, right? 
what are the different uh, have you has anyone here encountered a uh, type javascript array for example anyone done webgl opengl directx yep so effectively if you notice though you are untyping arrays in the in html5 specifications where webgl is coming you are actually you can actually say that and uh, this is a vector or this is a shader and this shader is of this type that's effectively what the gpu enabled uh, uh, gpu enabled guy does let me quickly go through the different data types uh, uh, the way your uh, browser works and does not work and then let me go to the final sections after that so as far as strings are concerned interestingly substring is an of one operation concat is optimized but concat is not optimized on opera and chrome i am not sure why though concat seem to have this problem similarly array as i said denser the better but then there are ways you can screw it up and we as programmers have the full power to screw it up functions again f f is faster f dot call is not because this is a direct function call but this is a dictionary lookup right f dot call you have to see what call means and then come back that's why f dot call is a little bit faster similarly using arguments slows down execution because it will have to then fetch the arguments from the stack box unbox them do stuff stuff like that prototypes are better than closures prototypes is prototype hierarchy but once you have gotten there you can use inline caches right similarly about exceptions funny thing i notice is mostly exceptions so whenever you put a code inside a try block it's mostly free because try doesn't do anything however the moment it goes into a catch sequence it's apparently very very expensive the other thing i have noticed is there are certain browsers in certain cases that throw out optimization when they see a try block i'm not sure why and do not use eval and with why because the shape that you created is completely thrown away with an eval or a with because the scope changes so how many of you here have heard people saying don't use eval and with why security yeah but apart from that it's also for optimization uh, okay now i'm not going to talk about this we'll see if you guys are able to help me with this so when i say save z what does box z mean what does boxing the value mean loud or loud i can't hear you outside with the outside noise what does box z mean Bo packing it basically and then the funny thing that these guys also do is there's a good chance that the z may be used later in an operation and instead of having to box it and unbox it again they just leave it in the register and they create a shape if required you know what shapes are right okay uh, garbage collection typically garbage collection is done using mark and sweep where you look at the whole uh, stack of objects you say this is used this is unused this is used this is unused and then you get the things out that are unused that's typical garbage collection a uh, browser use two types of enhancements over it first thing is incremental where rather than looking at the whole stack at every single time so problem with this is whenever you are trying to do animations and all your animations become jittery because suddenly your browser your browser thread will pause for garbage collection so they are trying to minimize those pauses by doing incremental just say look at the first 10 and then look at 10 to 20 then look at 20 to 30 that's incremental and finally you have generational where this is also in java by the way generational is some objects are short lived some objects are long lived you can keep collecting the short lived objects whenever they are long lived identify them and put them elsewhere so that you don't run gcs on them frequently any questions on incremental and generational okay and my final slide is i've told you so much how does it all change when ecma script next comes in what is the name of ecma 5 i don't remember the standard name either but yeah so one good thing is block scope will reduce variable lookups so instead of saying where you will have lets and all so you don't have to keep looking up or keep looking into the closures you will be defining the blocks where better think you uh, what is a yield operator has anyone here how many of you have heard about the yield operator okay so the idea with yield is it may cause us to save the current context this could be a performance issue we don't know other thing uh, we are going to have webgl which will have blob data so there's a talk on blob data uh, today and you know the problem with blob data is unboxing and boxing it may actually be a pain we do not know javascript ecmascript uh, next also so brendan ike also suggested this concept of classes and you know what classes may at the end of the day be direct representation of object shapes class may be good and things like assignment destructuring where you say stuff like x comma y is equal to 1 comma 2 that's just syntactic sugar so that won't help you much 
Similarly, promises, modules and all are just syntactic sugar on how the code is written. So I don't, I'm not sure whether they'll help you much. So conclusions, how to make your code the fastest? I'm serious, don't write any code, the browser doesn't have to do any work at all. But uh, this, for how many of us have this option? That's funny. You know, that's why I took program management at Microsoft because I don't have to write code. So yeah, that's the option, but don't write any code. But if you have to, uh, you can practice type safety. Remember that every time you say x is equal to 10 and x is equal to something, some uh, JavaScript browser, some JavaScript engineer skips a heartbeat. So give it a personal touch and try to practice type safety. Leave hotspots alone. Inside a loop, don't try to create objects if you, have, if you can do away with it because these are the parts that are optimized the most. Make an array dense and finally, uh, avoid operations that say 1 plus 1.1 1 plus 1 .1 because that requires type coercion. Again, the same type safety thing. So that's all I had. This is me. This is me again. And uh, we're open for questions for like minus one minutes. I just, I overshot my time, but I can take questions. Sure. I know I rushed through it because I didn't have time, but we can take it offline if the question is longer. Yeah, so this, uh, Car more generational. Least recently used. Or when was it last, when was the object last accessed? It has that extra housekeeping bit, but uh, this is how, it, it, you will know when was it last accessed. Things like that. And you can even do static code analysis to find out what are the places it was used at. Any other questions? The aim here is to squeeze every single bit. The difference may not be huge. I mean, you, you are better off doing DOM optimizations than this optimization. But this is a good thing to do. That's true. So the purpose of this session was to pop the hin uh, hood of the JavaScript engine and look what's inside it. And this, these are, this is the junk that we get outside, out of the hood. Any other questions? Thank you.